Uh, good morning and welcome to the second episode of the Star Insider Series. My name is Abby Lehman and I work at L3 Harris Geospatial and I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm joined again this week by my colleagues Megan Gallagher and JP Metcalf, both solutions engineers at L3 Harris Geospatial. First, a few things to know about Megan. She's our most experienced in-house SAR expert. She has an undergrad degree from Colorado School of Mines and a master's in geophysics from Boise State University. And she's been adding value to our organization since 2018. Say hello, Megan. Hey, everybody. Now, things to know about JP. Strike intelligence analyst in the US Navy for six years, 10 years teaching, completing research at Naval Postgraduate School, where he also got his master's in remote sensing intelligence science. Say hello. Hello, everybody. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I'll very quickly go through uh, you know, what the series is about for those that are unfamiliar. Long story short, Megan came to me with some amazing case study content a few months ago, but we knew that traditional webinars maybe weren't the best way to share it with the world. And around the same time, JP was looking to learn more about SAR, and so naturally, he tapped our in-house expert, Megan. So we decided to create a show that could do a little bit of both, and that's what you'll be part of today. You're sitting in on a conversation between two solutions engineers, two SEs, about SAR and how SAR was used to monitor vegetation in an agricultural setting. Now, before we get to the good stuff, I have a few moderations, moderator stuff to cover. Uh, as the lady bot announced at the beginning of the broadcast, this is being recorded and we will share the recording as well as the slide deck with you after we are done today. Please use the Q&A button along the bottom to submit questions at any point during the show. We'll do our best to work these in as we go along and get as many as we can answered. If you missed the first episode, you can watch the recording on our website, l3harrisgeospatial.com. This is also where you can register for the next live episode of the SAR Insider Series, and that is happening on December 8th. We'll be continuing to talk about SAR to monitor vegetation in that episode, but through the lens of deforestation, and you're not gonna wanna miss it. So that's all I've got. And with that, uh, I will go ahead and hand it over to Megan and JP to take it away. All right, thank you, Abby. And there we go. All right. Real quick, real oh, quick, Megan. Last, yeah. last episode was amazing. Uh, learned, we learned a lot on that. This time, I encourage everybody in, in the audience to, uh, if, if you, if you know the answer, if, if I ask a question, just let, let's, let's, let's chat about it and, uh, and, and figure out and, and work through a, a lot of this, uh, education with, with SAR that we're going to see, uh, last time. Yeah, it was, uh, we went over this amazing topic called co coherence change detection and, uh, really excited for agriculture this time, Megan. Take yeah, it away. This one is probably one of my favorite things to do with SAR mainly because if you can't see how pretty that picture is uh you know it's it can be an absolutely gorgeous case study kind of thing so i'm very much looking forward to talking about this one because it's not it tends to be a little bit overlooked sometimes when we're working with synthetic aperture radar not looking at like natural disasters and that kind of thing and i think it's a very powerful tool so this is a pretty fun one for me so as an overview, as an agriculture overview, we're gonna be using SAR intensity processes to monitor and track agriculture change. And the reason why we like to use SAR for this is where you have ag most of the time, you need to have water. And where you have water, you have rain, which comes from clouds. And guess what, once again, it's very hard to do constant monitoring over vegetation when there are clouds in the sky all the time. So if you need to do remote monitoring, you need to be able to see through those clouds and see what's happening at the ground surface level. With that, we can also use SARS interactions with the ground surface to do things like decipher crop type, look at crop, look at soil moisture content with specific bands, and even get things like biomass, which are some very dangerous words if you've ever worked with optical remote sensing data. Those are the terms that you tend to get a little bit like, oh no, using an optical sensor for biomass can be a very interesting thing that to be done. <laughs> but we can't do that with SAR, as long as you have some in-field like station set up and stuff. 
So that's why it's pretty fun to use here. And in, these, in this case study, we're mainly going to be looking at rice growth in Vietnam and then a very small slide on crop types in Boise, Idaho. And on this slide, as you can see, there is an absolutely gorgeous uh, Terrace Rx data over some fields in France. Just normal SAR data, I think it's like 1.2 meter resolution. And you can see all the different fields and all the different colors of the different stages of their growth. And speaking of biomass, you can tell that there looks like there's something kind of sticking up. It all, it all kind of has higher intensity and you can see its shadow. Yeah, so in some specific areas, like, I don't know if you can see my mouse, hopefully you can. Um, up here, all of those areas that look a bit more textured and a little bit like they're 3D are trees. So because they have such dense uh, tree cover in this region, you're actually able to separate them out very easily from agriculture, which is actually our sort of our, our next uh, <laughs> one's topic too, but it actually makes it really easy because if you've worked with optical data and you have done anything for looking at vegetation in an area that's highly forested, you can run into problems because green is green is green a lot of the time if you don't have a lot of bands. So if you're trying to differentiate between really green crops and really green trees, it can be really difficult. But because of the physical interactions of the SAR wave with the vegetation, you can much more easily separate them out. It's a good looking image. It's, it's a very good looking image. <laughs> Let's see. So a little bit of background on our area. Um, so rice is the dominant crop in Vietnam especially in the Mekong River Delta, where our area of interest lies. Its growth cycles and stages are not static in the least. It can change from field to field and year to year. And Vietnam grows wet rice, meaning the fields are flooded instead of dry, which has very unique responses in SAR signatures. Uh, the area that we're looking at is very similar to a case study done by SARMAP, the creators of SARScape, which is the process that I'm using for pretty much all of this today. Uh, because they did some amazing work on tracking of the floods in the Mekong River Delta, and I wanted to see what it was like in the past year. So, some, and as you can see, it, you can get some very pretty images out of it. All right, I do have a bunch of slides on background for using optical and SAR for agriculture monitoring, because there is a lot of information that I think is really important for people to get a foundation for this kind of thing, because like I said in the beginning, it tends to be a little bit overlooked. Uh, you, It's not a natural disaster. You're not looking at earthquake changes or looking at the imaginary parts of the wave of the SAR. Instead, you're just looking at what could be called the reflection response. But there's a lot of information we can get from just using that as well. Uh, for example, here we have an optical scene of Sentinel-2 on the left-hand side. And that Terrace Rx scene that I showed earlier on the right, where we can very easily see the field differentiation. And these are about two days apart from their collects. And the field differentiation in both the SAR and the, the optical scene are very stark. You can see the darker fields where the ground is flatter, maybe it's wetter. You can see the brighter fields where crops are growing because there's more reflectance response, just as easily between the two of them. So you can take things that you know from optical and then begin to see how they apply to the SAR scene as well. So it's not, it's not a scary thing to do, but it's really cool to see just how much they interact with each other. And the backscatter of SAR is affected greatly by crop type, soil moisture, and geometric effects. So that can make certain kinds of vegetation appear very different from very similar green colored vegetation around it. So if I'm growing two crops next to each other that are the same color green, if I was using optical data, I might be not having the best time. With SAR data, I might be able to separate them. We're looking at like a pretty sizable resolution difference, right? About 10 meters for Sentinel-2? Yes. Okay. And then there's, this is where that shadow comes in. You can, you can clearly see those shadows in that, that forested area where that 10 meter Sentinel-2 optical image, mm -hmm. really, really kind of hard to see those since they're the the trees are so dark yep green on green on green <laughs> <laughs> all 
Yeah. All right. So, some cool stuff. Uh, when we're working with SAR, there are actually a bunch of different bands that we can work with. And each of these bands tends to highlight different features. Uh, the most common sensors we have right now are X band, C band, and a little bit less common is L band. And each of these interact with different things so we can get different kinds of information from them. X band is our shortest wavelength, and this is commonly used for ocean monitoring, agriculture, and general service investigations, and it tends to be the highest resolution. Because it's smaller, it tends to interact with smaller things. So if you're actually monitoring crops with X band, you will see the growth sooner than you would with other bands. And that, that sounds a bit weird, but when a seed sprouts, it's very small because the X band is so small, it will interact with that better than some of the larger wavelengths. So you'll have better timing for the growth cycles themselves. C band is a little bit bigger than X band. And this one will interact with some a little bit bigger features, such as if you look at the little cool chart on the right hand side, it'll actually go into the trees and get some scattering there. It'll go a little bit into the ground surface. Uh, we'll be able to get a little bit more information on like the branches themselves. And so this one can be very useful with some specific kinds of crops, which we'll go over later, but it's more a little bit deeper into the actual features themselves. L band is a really cool system because that one will actually go all the way to the trunk. You'll be able to see the trees, you'll be able to get volumetric scattering, things like biomass and soil moisture are much better with L band because it won't be quite as overburdened by the top of the canopy. So each one of these bands has their own very specific features that you can use for crop monitoring, depending upon what you need to see. And when you take a remote sensing class, it's very helpful when the manufacturer of the satellite puts the band in the name, like mm -hmm. Terrasar X or CC. Yes. <laughs> uh, so when the professor does ask you, what, what band is that? What, what, what band is Terrasar X? You, you know right away. I should get into that convention. Yeah, I just put it in every single one. Like, uh, what's it? Nisar is coming out, and that's an L band. I can't. L -band, Nisar yeah. LP. <laughs> uh, that's not quite as catchy, I suppose, but it would be very useful. Real quick, Megan. Mm -hmm. I've I've heard the term ground penetrating radar, which I assume looks like a lawnmower. Uh, it, it does actually. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Depending. <laughs> I mean, attach that to my lawnmower. Um, <clears throat> what what band is that usually? Ooh, I don't remember off the top of my head. It, oh, it, isn't it? A, it's usually a spectrum, isn't it? Because you're doing it just like a normal seismic scan. So you want to go deeper and it actually goes through like a phase spectrum for it. I don't know if it's, yeah. Or does it depend upon the type? We'll Maybe outside someone's... of our scope, huh? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't study my GPR this morning, unfortunately. And it's been a couple of years since I've done a survey. <laughs> couple, oh gosh, at least six. Man, I haven't done a GPR survey in a while. <laughs> Let's see. Does anyone in chat remember? Any GPR? Any GPR experts in chat? It's been far too long for me, unfortunately. Oh, and here's some of the stuff I was talking about a little bit with that. Um, L and P band have those longer wavelengths and are dominated by soil backscatter. And they're mainly used for soil and moisture and information on thicker vegetation. And then C and X band interact mainly with the canopy. So X band works well for broadleafed plants like corn and soybeans, while both X and C band work well for narrow leaf plants like uh, grains. So there's actually a lot that goes into band choice that you, it might take a little bit at first to realize it just because like with optical data, we tend to think of things like, oh, multispectral or hyperspectral, depending upon the features I need to see. But for SAR, it's actually much more the physical characteristics that you need to start thinking about. What is the size of the thing I'm looking for? And that can take a little bit of time to sort of wrap your brain around. Megan, can you see any advantages of, of just collecting like a, a C and X or C or X, and then as well as the, the one that you know, penetrates? Absolutely. Um, because they'll get different responses, you can actually use them for classification together, uh, as well as more refined timelines. 
as well as you'll be able to see crop type differences in growth. So let's say I'm looking at a, a specific field with the, all of those bands together, like all of them separately can see changes in the field. Like maybe one area isn't growing quite as well as the others. But if I had all of them together and worked them all together, I'd be able to get much better understanding of that. It's pretty much the same as like hyperspectral data. Like maybe a lot of hyperspectral, a lot of bands are repeat, but the bands that you do have that are unique add more and more value to your situation. Okay. And uh, yeah, the um, to recap from last time, I would assume you have to use the same wavelength or at least the same sensor for if you wanted to do a CCD. Right. So if you want to do a time series, which we will be getting to, uh, you want to use the same sensor in the same position at the same wavelength, but you can do that with multiple sensors and then put them all together in the end. Okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So polarization is how the wave goes in and then returns or goes out and then returns to the sensor. And this does actually play an important part when we're talking about agriculture uh, because it's going to interact with different parts of the plant. So we talked about this a little bit last time, so I won't go into too much, but VV is vertical from the sensor, vertical back. HH is horizontal from the sensor, horizontal back. And VH and HB are, or HV are the opposites returned. So with them, we can actually get different kinds of ground characteristics when we're looking at agriculture. So a quad polarized system uh, will have the most information on, on the full understanding of vegetation. So, and the polarizations will all bring up different kinds of features that are usually affected by different aspects of the soil and vegetation. HH gets a lot of surface scattering and has a very small roughness feature. HV or VH is mainly moved around by volume scattering. And then VV is mainly has it's changed by vegetation structure itself, which is why things like those trees were so bright in that image because it was a VV and it was interacting with the tree vegetation structure versus things like grains. And so in this image on the screen here, I have a transect over some fields on the bottom right. And above it, I have what the VV and VH polarization responses looked like over those fields. And there are some big differences there. Uh, VH over fields where there's not any crops growing is very flat. It's really flat. Whereas it does spike up where there are some fields or even I think I got a tree in there somewhere. Yeah, a line of trees. Whereas VV is getting a lot more response from just the soil in those barren fields. So taking a look at how all these interact with your area is also really important. Real quick, do you think do you think VH and HV are interchangeable or are they are they widely different? They are exactly the same. Okay. They are completely interchangeable just because of how the SAR systems work. So you you would usually only collect one. You can collect both, but they because of the matrix that it's made of, it, they're they're the same thing. Makes it really easy to put into a red, green, and blue composite. Mm -hmm. All right, we've made it to the actual intensity time series. Uh, and so I'm going to go through this really quick. Um, and then we can take a look at some of the outputs, go over, take a look at it in SARScape, and also look at the SARScape analytics version of this. So uh, today's one is 11 images were used between June 1st, 2021 to September 29th, 2021. Uh, and this should look, if you were at the last webinar, exceptionally similar to the coherence change detection tools. It's the same kind of format, the same kind of setup, uh, same kind of processes in the background. We're just changing a couple of the tools that are actually involved. So first thing you have to do is input your data. If you have a DEM, you should use it and then hit that next button. With that, we start into multi-looking. And this is what is commonly done to intent to SAR data when you're first importing it. This is going over in the range and azimuth directions of your collected data to make it square shaped and proper and filter out some of that noise. And it'll just do it automatically for all 11 of those and also do some filtering over time as well. 
And so it does a much better, if you have more images, you'll get better results because the filtering that will be used is more advanced. So if you have one image, you won't have time filtering. And so it'll still be good, but if you have three or more images, it's usually much cleaner results in the end. Uh, after that is co-registration, which is something you should always try to do. And this is to co-register your scenes to each other and to an underlying DEM. Uh, unless you're over the ocean, in which case you can say co-register DEM off because a lot of times we don't have DEMs over the ocean. Uh, if you've ever worked with shift detection or looking at that kind of stuff before, it's very interesting to try to get that to all work properly. It works really well with SAR actually, because it is coming from the satellite, it has stuff. So when we co-register them all together, they're actually truly geo-referenced and orthorectified and where they should be. But you know, if you're tracking stuff over time, you wanna make sure your pixels match over time. So always an important step to make sure things are running properly. The next thing is another filtering technique. And this is actually, I'm gonna nerd out for a little bit. This filtering technique is amazing. <laughs> This uh, DeGrande spatiotemporal filtering. So it's in SARMAP, in SARScape, or excuse me, it's created by SARMAP, it's in SARScape, and it's fantastic. And it filters over space and time. So things like atmospheric effects are pretty much removed from your imagery after this kind of filtering. It cleans up so much of the speckle, and it's just a really cool filtering technique. So you should use it because it's amazing. But anyway, <laughs> thank you to Grande. Mm -hmm. uh, the next step is putting our things where they're supposed to be and then radiometrically calibrating them. So when you collect SAR, it's a non nadir system. It's looking sideways, not down. So as I lovingly like to say, sometimes your data can be upside down and backwards. And we don't want that when we're doing our finished processing. So we need to put it where it's supposed to go. Radiometric calibration is the exact same thing as what we do with optical data too, where you want to make sure all your scenes are comparable to each other. And so, whereas with optical data, we'd be moving it to reflectance after doing atmospheric correction, radiometric correct calibration makes sure that all of our scenes are within the same, they can all be compared to each other over space and time. And then we have are multi-temporal features. And this is where things can get very interesting. And this is where you can go through and be like, hmm, I wonder how many statistics I'd like to get for this entire data set. <laughs> I want all of them, means, standard deviation, median, gradient, max, min, max increment, max, dec like any kind of statistic you're interested in, you can choose. Turn them off, turn them on, and it will do all that processing for you and create a humongous stack of bands that is all of those different kinds of statistics. And so there, there's a whole bunch in here, right? That, that say uh -huh. true and false. Is uh, is Sarscape smart enough to to keep like a default true or false for the things that will produce the best? And then it's so, kind of up to you to turn them off or on. Yeah, pretty much. It starts with default, the ones that are the most common and the most useful. Like not like they did a humongous survey of everyone in the world, but the ones that tend to have the biggest difference in between them and that aren't duplicates of each other and that are most commonly used for statistics. So like you can see mode is off, fair, fair choice in my opinion. Um, mean is on, median's off. So you can of course just go in and click and change them if you find that, oh no, median, I need median. That's definitely the thing, the okay. one thing that I need more than anything else. But I haven't ever had an issue with like, I, I have tried all of them, but nowadays I tend to give me my, covariance, my mu sigma, my mean, uh, and then it's also some date stuff, which will come up, which is really cool. And that usually covers all the needs I have, so. Oh, right. and, and the, the date thing, it really does put it in sequential order, right? In timeline? It does, yes. Okay. And we actually did, I'm gonna answer one question from chat really quick, which is rain. Yes, that slide apparently wasn't in here, but rain and wind affect your vegetation. You will get a little bit of noise from rain, uh, not a humongous amount, but you can get some noise. So it's better to know when it is in case you're just like, why is everything a little bit more speckled than usual? But wind can completely change what your vegetation looks like because it's been blown over. So the physical characteristics can be very different. So 
having an idea about the weather in your area of interest is a very good thing to have. In Sarscape, they actually have, oh no, a link to ECMWF, which is the European Center for Meteorological Weather Forecasting. I probably got that acronym wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, but it does have a direct link to that as well. So you can actually bring in data sets of the kind of weather over the area you're interested in. Or I sometimes go to like AccuWeather and I look at their weather stations over areas to see what kind of changes are occurring nearby. So there are a lot of different options to make sure you keep track of that weather as well. Good question. And now this one is going to be a very quick animation. So I hope you're ready. This is what are the out well the output more or less, which is tracking the changes in these systems over time. I've green scaled it because it's vegetation, uh, and that amused me greatly. But it's with those images, we can actually see and track them over time as they're going. And that was just a real quick one, just so you can view that there are just with this intensity response, we can see changes at the surface. Wow, that looked really cool. And, uh, There's a okay. lot of stuff going on in this. <laughs> yes, this is a, a pretty, a fairly large area, I'll be honest. I might, I might have wanted to cut it down first, but it was really cool looking, so. Yeah, it looked like the, uh, the middle, uh, very high intensity. I assume white is high, green is kind of maybe. I think actually uh, green is. Green is high. Darker response, yeah. Green is oh, dark oh, and then yeah, white dark, is high. Okay. Yeah, you got it, you got it, you got it. Yeah, I got a little tiny, a uh, bunch of little, little tiny fields on the yeah. left hand side. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. So what we can actually look like here, ah, so it was the opposite. Uh, so this is one of the outputs you get, which is a standard intensity image output. And this is just one day, one scene, what we can see from that. If you have this one scene and you have in situ information, such as biomass and soil moisture with specific SAR bands, you can calculate it. Which is, <laughs> if you've worked with any kind of agricultural vegetation with optical data, that's insane. Like if you have information on your area and you have some in situ stuff, you can actually extrapolate that over your regions. Things will vary from field to field based upon how they're planted even but you can actually get some really good returns on what's happening at the ground surface level. And then at higher resolution, so like that TerraSRX image that I showed at the beginning, or any high resolution sensor, you can see variations within the fields themselves and physical characteristic variations, which is so cool. <laughs> But yeah, so this is one of the output products that you get, like the most basic level. You also get a time series that will automatically go through in NV. There's this like NV animation tool, and it will actually go through the bands for you. So you can automatically time series them and see what it looks like. And as I did, make a, a video of it. Uh, one of the other things is you will get a band stack of changes over time. And all of these together can be used to track those changes over time. So with multiple intensity images, you can track them and the growth of the field. So for example, with these rice fields, they were flooded in the beginning. So they were very, none of the energy was being returned to the satellite. So it's gonna be a very flat line and it has very low reflectance. As the plants grow and sprout, the reflectance will increase and this will have possible changes. Like in this case, it was from water to I'm beginning to see the rice grow, but it can also be the different growth stages of the crop or when the soil has been tilled or just like its leaves have literally opened. We get to see those physical changes. So in this one, by clicking on a region of interest, like where the little crosshairs are on the scene, I can track that pixel and see exactly how I'm getting my reflectance change over time. I can see when it started to grow. And if you have better temporal resolution, you can literally see the day it started to grow. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. So, so do you think that certain materials have like a reflectance property the same way it does in optical? So it's called, SAR wavelengths are affected by a lot of things, but there is a feature called the dielectric value, which comes into play a lot in geophysics. And that is the exact same as it is in SAR. So that's why we're able to see things like soil moisture and that's why SAR is affected greatly by whether we're looking through ice or sand. 
Um, there can be a little bit more difficulty, like being exceptionally particular about things, but it is affected by that dielectric value. Have you ever tried to create like a, a dielectric library? It has, so there's two things. There's, there is already a dielectric library. Like it exists. We know it in like a black body kind of way. Um, I bet there's someone out there that's made one for SAR already, to be honest. Uh, what I've been trying to make is actually a DNVR for SAR, which has been a bit more annoying, but that was mm -hmm. last time's topic, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, like there, there are humongous libraries of dielectric values because you have to use it for like, uh, when you're doing any kind of survey, you need to know what you're interacting with underneath the ground surface. So it's just a lot. I have like an entire book that has like too many things in it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and in the plot, so that's a Sarscape time series TS analyzer plot. Mm -hmm. And we have that, that dip around August 13th. What, what do you think that is? It wasn't, so it could be wind. I didn't look at the weather for that one, unfortunately. Uh, but because we can see it goes back up afterwards, maybe I got really unlucky and someone in that exact pixel was moving things around at the exact time that I chose it. But it is fairly stable in its growth period, or maybe they were doing something in there. I don't know. That's why whenever you're using stuff with ag, it's always the better, best to have someone on the field for you. Yeah. If you can. Yes. Those in C2 measurements. Uh, they're, they're the absolute best. I, I miss them very much, but unfortunately I couldn't go to Vietnam. So. That's too bad. I know. Such a shame. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right. Chaos. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. This is what is called the max date. So besides all of the statistics and all of the dates information that we get, we also get very special classifications. And these are max date, min date, gradient date, like highest gradient date, lowest gradient date like most stable. And all of these also tell us very unique things about our agriculture. So max date will show us the date in which the re re reflectance response was the highest. So pretty much this just classified the highest point of growth for us immediately. Or in some cases, when people go absolutely crazy when they're trying to re -sow a field, <laughs> which you have to watch out for sometimes. Lots of dirt everywhere can also make higher reflectance. But most of the time, this is when the fields are at their highest peak. So you have your timing immediately classified for growth. You can also have it for gradient, which means that's either if you have slow growth stages, that's usually when the crop has been your, when it's been finished, when it's done, when it's been taken down, processed, that kind of stuff. So these tools will just go in, look at the changes, look at that max reflectance response and automatically do all of the work for you, which is pretty sweet too. <laughs> Here's a quick question. Mm -hmm. Who, who's doing this? Is this, this isn't like the farmer level, right? Like, uh, is, it, is it government organizations looking for, you know, max yield for the year or? Uh, that in a lot of the, some of the use cases I've seen in my SAR map are also to monitor, I forget exactly where this was, but they did a very interesting one over, there was flooding in a lot of fields. And actually I've done flooding in Nebraska too. And so by doing this, you can see areas that are affected, or if you have things like you need to monitor biomass, or you're having some, you're trying to look at what's happening with these fields. So I would agree. I would say it's a little bit of a farmer level. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does give unique information that I think can be used by pretty much, well, I'm biased. So I like, I would use it, but I think the amount of information we get from it is just as equivalent to any time you'd use optical data over agricultural fields, which is a big thing of trying to monitor them, see best cases, see if there's something going on there, growth structures, that kind of stuff. Uh, I would say it is a pretty much equivalent. It just takes a little bit more well, the reason why we're doing this webinar series, it takes a little bit more forefront knowledge to be like, oh, I wonder, can I use SAR to do this? Or why would I use SAR to do this? So, yeah. <laughs> in, in some cases, flooding, flooding is good with uh, mm -hmm. 
Well, I don't know how much water you need for a rice patty, but well, flooding at the wrong time is bad. That makes sense. Yeah, so it can be tricky. The Nebraska one, though, flooding was just bad in general. That was not a good thing because I think <laughs> they lost so so much. It was too moist to even plant for a lot of the fields because of the flooding, and so all of the schedules were either off or impossible for the Nebraska use case that I did a couple of years ago. Too much of a good thing, huh? I don't think it was very good in that case, I'll be honest. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty bad. A lot, too much water. Uh, yeah, and then we've moved from Vietnam for this last picture. It's not quite as pretty. It is much smaller. But what this is, is when we're looking at rice, this can't really be shown off as well. Uh, this is, you can actually vary, the, you can differentiate crop type. So using the same intensity time series tool, I picked fields at random, and then I could use those ROIs to look at the crop type growth and reflectance. Uh, I did this in a previous webinar over France, and you could actually do things like separate out wheat and different kinds of crops and that kind of stuff too. You can even add optical data with this to work on even more. Optical and SAR data working together has been shown to actually greatly improve the accuracy of classifications. So I just wanted to show this off because you can separate out fields and I even find very similar crop types and use them that way. Real quick, ROI, region of interest. Yes, thank you. Region that of would be interest. Those <laughs> green, green and fuchsia boxes, red. Yep. yep. Uh, also area of interest and it's a tool in NV to like draw shapes so you can do crazy science over them when you want. Oh, wow. And ta-da. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm really proud of this image. So this is a covariance minimum gradient image, which is also an output of doing the intensity time series tool. So it takes those three statistics, puts them in red, green, and blue, and then creates an absolutely gorgeous image for you to look at. Beautiful. <laughs> It is. So it looks like yellow is kind of like the lines of communication, uh, whether it's, you know, roadways, mm -hmm. dirt roadways, maybe. Stable uh, is usually like stained so glass. It does look like stained glass. It's actually stable. Yeah. So those are areas where the covariance is low. Covariance minimum and the minimum was like one of the highest things most of the time. So urban areas will be brighter in that case. Because mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not growing or doing anything. Right, and with the double bounce reflectance response, they're always brighter, right? Mm. Because more of the energy returns to the satellite. So we can really easily separate out urban agriculture trees and also get some pretty cool looking images. <laughs> now is this, has this been subset at all? Like, do we do we see more of this area normally? Uh, yeah, that was actually way at the beginning. Noom. There we go. This was the full image. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I made a smaller one that held the pretty colors in it. <laughs> but you can actually see, like, the river is red. Like, the full river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you can see all of the different urban areas, the fields, the crops, and that kind of stuff, too. That's a lot of information content. Yes, <laughs> it really is. But usually you don't focus on this large of an area. Usually you focus on a much smaller case study area. I just wanted to see what would happen. So. And, and how long did that take? Mm -hmm. This is pretty recent stuff, right? September 2021 yep. was the last image. Yeah, near October. So because I decided not to subset my image, it took a lot longer than if I had mm. actually done the proper thing and subset it because that was an entire Sentinel-1 scene. Mm -hmm. So I, I was not being the most, um, I really should have subset it first, but I really wanted to see what would happen. I think it took three hours, four hours maybe on an AWS machine. Probably around three bad. hours. No, it's not bad. It depends upon the processing you have in the background, though. Always subset anyone out there. Don't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that time I tried to do an entire thing over Hawaii, and that took, mm -mm, don't do it. 
<laughs> unless you have a really good machine or a cluster. And then, so say September 29th, it sounded like was the last image. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to wait like another six months or until the, the next growing season, could you just add to what you have or does it have to reprocess everything? So with intensity time series, it's better to do them in chunks because you want to keep them related to each other. Like if you have an area that you want to see what happened over three years and you keep it all connected, you can do that. You can absolutely, I did that for another vegetation one, which is winter can add some weird things if there's snow on the ground though, warning, snow on the ground, big problem. Um, but like you can do that. But if you're only looking at crop growth, it's probably easier on your memory and your processing to just make a time like June to October every year and do that instead. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a long time to wait around to, <laughs> to run your processing. But I guess you can always just go back and be like, All right, you know, here's my last image, September 29th. I'm going to go back a few. But it, it sounds like from the last time we talked that there's like a cold storage you got to kind of get at. Right. And it's not too bad, though, with the way that Surfscape pings it. Like I haven't, I don't have issues with it anymore. Like I sometimes used to. So it's not that bad. And you can like go day by date and just look at changes like one at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're trying to really like in this first week, what happened? Oh my gosh, you could do that. So. That's, that's very cool. Is, is that the last slide? It is. The next one is us. Oh, <laughs> there we are. It's us. Uh, I'm actually going to quickly change it over to Sarscape, and then I'm going to huh, show off. You guys went through that like an ace. <laughs> <laughs> a bit, maybe a bit too fast, but it's always so exciting. <laughs> That's okay. We always have lots of questions for this show. So mm, where yep. is... I'm looking at a lot of questions in here, huh? Oh. That's good. We got that open. Too many screens. Feel free to address any of those, JP. Yeah, I'm not figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a show all windows button. There we go. Ha. <laughs> oh. There we go. We, we can see Envy. All right. Sweet. All right. Back to Envy. Envy Sarscape, here we are. So where it lives, the, it is in, I'm gonna close everything up. We have the basic module here, and then we have intensity time series workflow. So that's what I used for this one. All of the steps are actually also separated out. So you can choose if you want to only go through specific steps too. Like if you only want a multi-look or you only want a geocode or working with one single image, you can do that there too or like feature extraction stuff. So coherence, multi-temporal coherence, coefficient variation, et cetera, et cetera. But then, because we talked about Sarscape, we also have the Sarscape analytics toolbox, which has, if I can read properly, it's our time series. It's got a whole different icon on everything. I know, right? It's really cool. Uh, this is the, the grab and go version of the exact same tool that we just used. So I would put in my 11 files here and I won't because I don't want this webinar to last four hours longer than it should. <laughs> uh, I can say like, I only want to look at co-polarization. I can have my DEM and then I choose my output folder. I, I literally just need to say, here are my files here's my output folder and then hit okay. And so I will one, get one screen for that whole like mm -hmm. workflow that we saw earlier. Yep. It, the trade-off is of course is in the workflow. I can mess around with all of the parameters. I can go a little bit crazy in there on this one. If I just need that, like the date stuff, if I just need that intensity band series, I can use this. So it really depends upon how in depth you need to go or how, you know, do I just need to be like, I need to see if there's change over time. Cool, let's use the Sarscape analytics to do so. So if you are going through a much more scientific approach, 
I guess, no, they're both exceptionally scientific. That's a, a bad way to state it. If you want to get into the details and the parameters and you want to do different kinds of filtering, then that's when you'd want to start working with Starscape itself. Well, well, now that I know all this now, <laughs> my, my, maybe my next little project is to monitor how Christmas trees are doing in those Christmas tree farms. I was actually asked that once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, can you, can you look at the Christmas trees? It's like, I suppose it depends on where it is and if it's snowing. <laughs> yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. I think trees are the topic of nest time, but they can be a little bit interesting with the band wavelengths that are commonly available right now, because we don't have L band as easy to access. There are a lot of sensors out there, but it, I can't get them for free. <laughs> like I can yeah. Sentinel-1. So it's a little bit more difficult. And I do like using Sentinel-1 for these because people can go out and do this themselves. You can go download the same Sentinel-1 files I did and do the process yourself and hopefully get the exact same results. So that's why I like using them for these little case studies so people can go and be like, all right, how does this actually work? And would it be smart to use VB for Christmas trees since they're vertical? Vegetation structure, probably based upon yeah, what you want from them. I'll get started today downloading from uh, the Sentinel website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, we have, we have tons of stuff in here. We do. I'm going to so, reshare my screen really quick so you can there, go. There was a few questions in here about that intensity drop in August. I think we, uh, that, that could have been a number of factors. Um, not so clear. I, I wouldn't assume it was a whole different crop within that time frame. No. Uh, and I don't, and I think when I was looking around, that was not a feature that was everywhere. So because there were some fields that were not affected by that drop, uh, but I can also go back and see, but I think it was just a, Maybe the wind was there that day, a bit windier than usual. Oh, and that, that profile that we did see, we, we have one of those for each pixel. And, and, and that one that we were looking at that, that showed that drop in August was just for one pixel, right? One singular pixel. For yeah. the oh, other oh. one with the Boise crops, yeah, so one singular pixel might have had a drop. <laughs> but for the <laughs> Boise crops, that was that entire area that you saw. So it was averaged over that area, which you can do too. You mm, can either okay. choose a singular point or an entire field, depending. Like singular point tends to not be the best choice unless you're looking at sub crop changes, like sub field changes, not sub crop. Uh, like if you're looking in a field, trying to figure out what's happening, uh, area of interest is better if you're trying to look at an entire field's growth or compare it to other fields. Okay. Let's see. I saw one asked, of, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I see a question about uh, if we have training modules on it, but I only mention it because I think <laughs> Megan made those. So I want to <laughs> so, give her props for that. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of background training modules made by SARMAP. I am working on a lot of stuff right now. Things like these case studies, seeing I've worked on a couple of classes that are soon to be finished, I hope. Um, I will actually have this as a blog post in the future where it'll go through the steps with the person. Like I, I've recorded me running this process. So it will actually go through the steps with you as well as it is going to be recorded as like a, an official case study instead of me just talking about it, very excited all the time but I am working on getting even more training, but there is some that exists. So if you're interested, we can bombard you with links. <laughs> Let's see, we got a few about the tropics. Can this, Stephen Vance asked, can this technology be used to discern species types mm. of trees in brush? Have you done this? And what quality of satellite data do you have for Central Africa? That is a fun question. So I'm not going to use my favorite catchphrase, which is it depends, but um, <laughs> it has to be your choice of band is going to be very important, as well as your choice of polarization. When you're getting into very specific structured vegetation changes that need to be mapped, 
you should go for bands like L band because they'll interact more with the structure of the vegetation as long as it's different from each other. Similar to how with optical data, if green is green is green, if you're looking at the difference between two types of pine trees that only have chemical differences, you're probably not gonna be able to see them. If you're looking at the difference between a pine tree and a brush, they will give those different volumetric responses. But with that, you might need a quad pole system, <clears throat> excuse me, to truly very accurately define that existence. Because when we're using quad pole systems, and actually I think SART, Sarscape just came out with a dual pole of this one that I haven't tested yet, but I'm really excited. We're able to actually separate out what exactly that wavelength interacted with. So uh, the best example I could use of this is we've used optical is sort of like sub pixel analysis a little bit where you could see what exactly that wave was bouncing around and hitting and what it interacted with. If it was like a ground surface, if it was a tree, and so you'd probably want a longer wavelength, one, to penetrate through the vegetation, especially if there's shrub under trees, because that you can see it, but that is a thing. And then, oh, we also just added a tomography tool. So mm. with very specific kinds of collects, like very specific collects, you can actually do tomography. So over forest and stuff with SAR as well. So there are a lot of options. Like there's a lot of ways to do it. I personally haven't separated out trees and shrub. I haven't worked too much in um, Central Africa yet. I've worked in South America a little bit, which is actually the focus of our next webinar because that one's gonna be focused on deforestation, which is very easy to see. So there are some major changes between forested areas, shrub areas and areas that have been cleared as well. And for quality of satellite data, uh, I, I would say L band, <laughs> L or P band. Uh, you might be able to get some surface scattering from C band and you can test out. You can always test it out with C band because it's publicly available. But when you're getting to, to having to do more of the process, L band, and then uh, Sentinel-1 is either weekly or bi-weekly, depending upon where you are on the earth. So it's always a good place to sort of poke at it and see how it works out. Yeah, and I think this might be answered. Austin is, is frantically typing out answers. <laughs> uh, one of them was really good. So we, we have several vegetation indices for optical data uh, mm -hmm. that, to include the, the infrared bands oh, yeah. and DVIs more obvious one, several different ones, green um, and DVI. And then one of the questions I think Jose asked it was, is there a vegetation index that you would normally run using a SAR image or, or a series of SAR, SAR images? So, yes, uh, oh, tricky, tricky. I don't know if I can, we're doing some very interesting stuff in the future. <laughs> Let me just leave it like that for now. That can do some pretty cool things. So the answer is yes. And then sort of thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go into it too much right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sounds very covert. I'm sorry. I don't know if I could talk about it. <laughs> very covert. So we are starting to get near our time. We have about seven minutes left. Uh, if you guys want to pick a question, I mean, there we had a bunch of them like we did the last time, uh, but I wanted to give you a chance to wrap up any questions you wanted to get to. I'm, I'm like scrolling through here like crazy trying to... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh... <laughs> I like the questions that ask about the polarization because that, that's always that's one of those things that you don't really encounter. There is optical polarization. Not, not a lot of sensors are doing that. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, it does make it kind of, you know, as soon as you see that there's VV out uh, or a horizontal, horizontal, and then that certain sensors, they, they pick one. I think mm -hmm. uh, Capella's HH only. Yes. So, so they, they made a, a design choice to say, mm -hmm. no, we're, we're only going to do this uh, based on the things that we look at. Right. So, and so actually, even with Sentinel-1, it actually changes polarizations over the ice caps. It goes from VV to HH because okay. HH best responds and interacts with ice. 
<laughs> so it's really cool. <laughs> and it, it, it's almost funny to think that that the satellite would just turn 90 degrees. <laughs> to get <it> Which <laughs> uh, I think I'm, I'm fairly certain it's just the sensor. If the entire satellite yeah. turned, that'd be a pretty cool tool, but I think that could yeah, cause right? a bit more issues. <laughs> It's like uh, what the space station with the collects on it and stuff, where it can mm. sometimes like turn, and so it. <laughs> yeah, you just maneuver to get the the different polarization. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll just flip everything around and it'll work out perfectly. Here's a good one: uh, Sarscape with NV53 and above can it handle Novasar S band data sets? Uh, I believe so. I can check right now because I have it open. Novasar. Yep. Perfect. So it's got an ingestion technique in there specifically mm -hmm. for Novasar. Okay. Yep, it does. I'm not familiar with Novasar. Sounds, it, sounds cool. Yeah, I've actually, I have worked a little bit with it in the past. Um, I was one of the first people who actually messed around with that import tool there. I don't know why I had to check it honestly just to make sure that it was there since I used it in the past, but here we are. Uh, it's a pretty cool system. It's another small SAT system. Um, so it has some pretty good coverage. I think right. it came out like three years ago, two years ago, maybe more. Because you're in on the up-to-date stuff. You're, hit, <laughs> you're with it. And we're still waiting for Nisar? Yes, forever. And that's S-band, right? L and P-band. L and P. But I believe the P-band is only over India. Oh, special. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because it is... That's what, that's, that's what you get when you manufacture your own satellite, huh? It is a joint venture between uh, NASA and the Indian Space Agency. I, I, I don't remember. I'm sorry. I'm horrible with acronyms, uh, either rem remembering them or renaming them. Uh, and so the, the how the sensors are split up is just based upon that. Okay. Looks like we got corrected. It's uh, L and S. S band. I thought it was P. Cool. That's better. Who knows? Maybe they changed their mind. It's not even out yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got corrected a lot. Thank you. I'm glad. I did think it was P band, so I'm glad that it's it actually software update. <laughs> All right, guys, we are getting real close to our <laughs> hour long date. So I'm going to start to wrap it up. Um, okay. You know, we always have more to talk about, and I would love to just let you guys talk for a while, but. Unfortunately, we have the time limit. So <laughs> thanks to everyone for joining us live and thank you to Megan and JP. Remember that the recording plus the slide deck for this will be available shortly and you'll receive an email as soon as it's available. So go out and register for our next live episode of the SAR Insider Series. That is happening on December 8th, right? December 8th. I think so. <laughs> and we'll be looking at uh, deforestation as Megan mentioned uh, with SAR. So once again, the website l3harrisgeospatial.com where you can find recordings and register for the next one. Um, Megan, do you have any interest in giving a teaser for the next one in less than a minute, one minute uh, teaser? Yep. Yeah. I randomly decided to look for deforestation in the Amazon and I found it. Oh, well, that's a good summation of what we're gonna talk about. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right, thanks again, everybody. And uh, I hope to see you next time. Everyone have a good day. Have a great day, Thanks everybody. Thanks for joining.